Hello everyone, hopefully uh, you can hear me. It's Tom here, um, it's four o'clock, um, so I thought I would make a start. Um, I hope you've all had a good week and that uh, you managed to have a bit of a break um, over half term last week. Um, if you didn't join us, uh, it's nice to see a few more people here today. Um, this will be the last Society Policy uh, Zoom update um, in June, uh, which I'll talk about um, at the end. So I'm really going to focus on are the final checks um, and um, things to consider in terms of uh, results this summer, but also looking ahead um, to the autumn series. Other colleagues will be picking up issues about school reopenings uh, later this month. Uh, the second reason on the 15th of June, and of course what's already happening in primaries um, at the moment, um, but that will be picked up um, uh, elsewhere. Um, so um, without further ado, let's um, have a think about um, uh, the final checks that need to be in place uh, for um, the submissions uh, in the next couple of weeks. I know obviously all of you will be working on this um, at the moment. So um, obviously you'll all be doing your final internal moderation and quality assurance. And I've had lots of questions about what this should look like. And the simple answer is there is no one fixed way. Um, and essentially, um, you know, use your, uh, your current quality assurance um, processes as an SLT to, um, uh, to ensure that you as senior leaders are happy that the grades and rankings that you are submitted are rigorous and accurate. Um, you'll be making those final ranking decisions, and I think particularly that's really important for those large subjects, you know, sort of GCSE, English and Maths, where you might have, an, a, you know, 70 odd students who are all on the same grade, trying to get that ranking down is going to be really difficult, and we appreciate that. Similarly, uh, for EPQ um, at A-level, where you might have lots of bunching um, around the seven mark, and Ofqual are aware <coughs> of, those, um, of those subjects. Um, you might have missed this, but Ofqual have now said that for very, very large cohorts, um, you can bunch students within a single rank. So as you know, you have to have, um, uh, most schools will have to have uh, uh, each candidate as a separate rank. That's not the same for very large cohorts, but we're only talking about cohorts um, of 500 or more in any one qualification. So it really won't um, uh, apply to many schools or to many sick forms uh, at all. Um, what I should say, sorry, I should have said it uh, earlier, um, if you do have any questions as we go through today, um, please do write them in the chat function of Zoom and my colleague uh, Mike, as ever, will pick those up um, and, and, uh, and come in at, at certain points or pick them up at the end. So um, having made your final round decisions, um, really, really important to check the candidates of students at the top and the bottom of each of those ranks, because again, they are the ones that are most likely to see their um, centre assessed grades changed through standardisation. So really, really important uh, to check those people and check you're happy with the top and bottom of the rank, the middle of the rank, perhaps matters slightly less. Um, I've had lots of questions, um, particularly um, uh, since the start of this week, um, where many of you are now about to submit your data, um, departments have been through this process and you as senior teams have got the data. Um, and what um, SLTs are asking me is, well, we'll look at the data and it doesn't look like our previous years. It doesn't look like the transition matrices suggested should. I think it's a really useful activity to do to check that data. Um, but don't try and adjust those grades to make it a perfect fit. Ofqual have already said they expect some fluctuation. You know, no school gets the exact same results every year. And remember that your previous results are just one part of the standardization formula, and we don't yet have that formula, and it will differ from subject to subject. Uh, and Ofqual acknowledge that in smaller subjects, results fluctuate uh, more than others. So if you haven't done yet, you know, do have a look at what your heads of departments are telling you and see whether this looks like your previous years. However, uh, and we do differ from some other organisations here, and I know some organisations are saying to, to make it very uh, data-based, um, ultimately it's a sense check. And uh, we would be very um, uh, mindful of trying to adjust grades down or up 
purely based on historical data. We don't yet have those formulas. We don't have the transition matrices that they will use uh, in the final standardization formula. So um, use it as a guide. And as SLT, if you have a particular subject that seems to have shown a massive inflation, and certainly go back to them and ask what, what's happening as part of that quality assurance process, but certainly don't try and fit it perfectly to your, your previous results. At the same time, if you are expecting an inflation this year, so not an inflation, a, 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 an improvement this year in terms of results, it is important to manage the expectations of heads of department and staff um, because, uh, of course, um, we do know that through standardisation, you may see your, your grades adjusted, and I'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of submission, we know that different exam boards are using different systems, and you've been telling us that some are better than others. A particular exam board in particular, with the manual um, entry system we know is causing you uh, quite a lot of uh, stress. Um, but I suppose the, the key thing here is you know, check, check, and check again. Remember, once that data is submitted, um, there is no checks the exam boards can do. They are just going on what you submit to them. And, you know, one in particular is very, very clunky. So whoever is submitting that data, you know, really make sure that they are um, triple checking that that, that that is correct. Um, just a, a point that that's a question that's been raised before. Hopefully um, you've picked up on this um, through the, the list of messages, uh, through the, the email forum messages. Um, but if you are entering um, students in the same subject into qualifications with different exam boards, you do just do one rank list and uh, one of the exam boards, the exam board who you have most entries with, will be the lead for that particular subject. And they will have hopefully already been in touch with you to tell you they're the lead um, uh, exam board uh, and they will instruct you what to do, but it won't be through the normal process. So if, for example, you're doing GCSEs and IGCSEs in English, um, that is one rank list and the, the biggest exam board will have been in touch to tell you how to submit that. Um, and then, of course, private candidates, you know, sort of don't leave them to the last minute. They need to be included fully in your rank order. As we um, discussed uh, last week and the week before, Ofqual has said that um, including private candidates in your rank order will not affect um, your, your on-roll student's grades. I still don't quite understand how it can't do that because, of course, if you're putting a, a private candidate as a number one, it's never be going to. So um, just some kind of final checks um, in these last two weeks before we submit grades <clears throat> before mid-June. Um, in terms of managing the expectations of staff, um, just a reminder, of course, that um, uh, all of the, the teacher assessed grades, the centre assessed grades, uh, and the rank order have to remain confidential at the moment. But of course, staff um, will be aware of them. And again, this really is a question I've been asked a lot over the last, um, the last four days. Um, if you're looking at that data and it looks different to your previous years, should you be adjusting it down? Uh, and what I will say is if you're in that position, you're not alone. A lot of schools out there are in that position. If you are confident as a school, as a head teacher, as an SLT, that those grades you are providing are accurate, don't mark them down just because of the data. However, it's important to remind staff and heads of department in particular that Ofqual has said all schools should expect to see some adjustment. So at this point, be telling your heads of department if your grades are all marked down or up, that's not a reflection on your judgment. Ofqual has said that even with the most accurate judgment, they expect to see some adjustment. So um, it's not a reflection on their ability to assess, and Ofqual have already said that. Ultimately, this is out of your control. Um, we don't know what the standardization formula will look like in each subject. We don't know the weighting of previous results as opposed to prior attainment. So essentially, don't worry too much about it. I know that's really hard to... Uh, hard hard to do uh, and very easy for me to say, um, but, but it is out of our control. So instead, let's really return to what we've been asked to do uh, as schools, which is to um, provide what we think is the most likely grade a student would have got had they sat exams this summer. If that is higher than your previous grades, 
then that's what you should submit. Uh, but do manage those expectations. And remember, of course, that all of this when we're talking about is just um, the grades for individual students. Um, these will not be published. There are no performance tables this year. Um, this won't fit into Progress 8. Um, nobody but the student and you will know their result. Um, so it's about doing what's right uh, for the student. Um, equally, I think it's important to, uh, to remind staff uh, and heads of department, and, including heads of department and teaching staff, um, that performance this year should not be used uh, for quality assurance or performance management. Uh, that we can't use the results from this summer for performance management. And so again, heads of department shouldn't worry, overly worry, about those results being marked down. And I think ultimately there will be some schools who win and lose. If you are if you are a school that has a department that was really predicting much better results this year with similar students because you've got a new head of department last year or uh, a change to the curriculum, unfortunately, we know that even if you were predicting better results, those results might be marked down. And of course, there will be schools as well who um, were, were predicting to get um, uh, worse results this year and they've almost been given a um, a bit of a get out of jail free card this year. So um, there will be schools that win and lose. It's not a perfect system, um, you know, but we are living through a, a global pandemic and, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of managing expectations of students, parents, carers and families, um, remember that most students hopefully won't find out their centre assessed grade, the grade the teacher gives them. They will just get um, their final calculated grade in August. They will only get that, that uh, centre assess grade if they put in a data subject access request, which I'll talk about in a moment. So that calculated grade, it's worth reminding students and, and families at this point, is not what the school gave them. Ofqual has said, and I repeat this, you know, unashamedly, Ofqual has said, all schools should expect to see adjustment. So that calculated grade is not the same as the center assess grade. Obviously grades matter to students, they really do, and you will have been telling them for years and years how important grades are. But the point about this year is to focus on progression, about where students are going to go next, and that's the more important thing. So I think part of the narrative now, as students start to, to look ahead to August, is to say, yeah, these results are important, but it has been a weird year. It's been an extraordinary year. And what we really need to focus on is not the grades you got, but where you're going next. And that has been the whole approach from the government um, going forward. And, and it's worth reassuring uh, students and, and parents that, that colleges, sick forms and universities, including the Russell Group, have all said, we understand this is different. We understand that you as a student haven't had the same level of control over your grades as you usually would. And they are open to having conversations about why uh, you might have missed out on entry grades and so on. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you as a network uh, in a moment is about the autumn research. And increasingly, I, I feel, I'd like your views on this, that we should be discouraging those, those autumn research for students. Uh, I don't think it's in, in young people's best interest to be sitting exams halfway through the autumn term, but I will talk more about that and I really appreciate any comments you have. And again, really discouraging appeals. Remember that there is very, very limited opportunity for both uh, centres and candidates to appeal the decisions and certainly they can't appeal uh, around the uh, centre assess grade they've got unless they can prove that they had, um, that teachers were biased against them and you as a school can't um, appeal against the standardisation formula. So um, on that note, actually, very quickly, we've yeah. had a question in, which is quite timely. So on results day, are we allowed to or should we let students know if they have had the grades that have been submitted changed? No, um, no, absolutely not. So I, 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 I will come on to this in more detail in a moment. But on results day, you should still treat the centre assess grade as confidential unless there has been a, a, a data subject access request. So. Um, you certainly shouldn't be preparing to say, well, this is what you got, but here's what we gave you. Um, you should only do that on a case-by-case -case basis if um, a student has asked for that. 
which I will come on to now. Um, so in terms of that, that, those issues around confidentiality, freedom of information and data subject access requests, just remember at the moment until the results date, that information must be kept confidential. Um, you know, a, a, even informally, a teacher cannot say to a student who asks, oh, well, I, I, I'm going to give you a, 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 a grade five. And that, that has to be kept confidential. Um, if there is any evidence for teachers have done that, it is exam malpractice and could be considered gross misconduct, depending uh, on the terms and conditions of your, your contract. Um, because of the nature of this, because we're talking about public data, about a data subject, i.e. a student, um, obviously the law, since GDPR came in, has been that all of your emails and messages that relate to that subject should be tracked uh, and cannot be deleted and this should all be in, in your data privacy policy. So you should very easily as a school be able to find any data that you hold on a particular student um, and that would include for example a one word email where an English teacher says actually I think that Johnny should be slightly higher up in the rank than he currently is. So all of that um, all of those emails you should be able to uh, uh, access very quickly and track according to students and of course but th this isn't new you know this has been uh, in place since GDPR came in um, and of course it's not okay just to delete those emails you know, you're almost certainly your, your data privacy policy wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't allow for that one of the key questions that we've had in since we had the specific policy update around these issues um, was something that um, Chris, the uh, lawyer that we, that we had uh, talking to us mentioned, where he said, there is no formal way that you put in an FOI or a DSAR. There isn't a form, there isn't any language. And this, this has raised quite a few um, alarm bells for a lot of you, where if a student um, innocently, I say innocently, or just um, uh, informally, lightheartedly, just says to a, to a teacher, oh, miss, uh, um, what grade are you giving me for history? That should be regarded as a data subject access request, even if the student doesn't realise it. So, uh, obviously, the way that you would have responded immediately is to say, well, we can't tell you that we're not allowed to. Um, however, because they have asked that, even if they didn't realise that that's what they were doing, you should re be responding to that formally after August. That is uh, your legal duty. So one thing you need to make sure that teachers know is that if they do have what might seem like a very, very offhand email or offhand comment where, where a student says, can you tell me what I've got? Even if actually they're quite happy not to know, if they've asked the question, it is your legal duty to follow that up. And with, if you don't do that, you are breaking data regulation laws. So you have a couple of options there. Either you can treat each of those emails as a formal request and deal with them after August, or you can ask the student whether they are making a formal request. Um, uh, but of course, then you're drawing attention to it. Um, but, but one thing your teachers do need to know is that just that, just that one question, what, am I, what, what, what are you giving me, sir? Miss, that is um, a formal um, request because there is no particular language you need to use. And I think that alarmed uh, some people on the call, but you do need to respond to those uh, in exactly the same way as a much more formal request come August. Um, so yes, you do need to follow those up. Um, some confusion about the difference between a freedom of information and a data subject access request. So a freedom of, and basically, again, it depends on the wording, um, an FOI would relate to the process that you went through as a school to arrive at the um, uh, arrive at the decisions that you did, and it wouldn't necessarily involve disclosing the centre assessed grade or rank order of any individual student. So it's much more about what do you do as a school, um, including any documents that you use. So they might be documents that we sent out. It could be slides that we've used. So you'd include all of that. And what we suggested on the call is that as schools, you get a pack together 
so that you can just send that out um, if you get those sorts of requests. A data subject access request would be more specific. That would be an individual student uh, who is requesting the data you hold on them, and presumably they'd be requesting the center assessed grade you gave and their order in the rank. And you would need to give that as well as any accompanying um, documentation that related to them, which is why that tracking of emails is so important, including deleted emails, because they will still be stored on your server. So um, obviously in the next kind of week or so, um, your staff will be busy finalizing um, all of the grades and submitting those. But then a question you really need to say is, um, are we ready to respond in August? You know, have you asked all of your staff to keep a list of the students that have put in a DSAR, maybe without realizing it, because your legal duty is to respond to those. So that's probably the next kind of uh, task ahead of August to check that you do know who is, um, which students have requested that in which subject. And of course, they might have just asked one subject teacher, in which case you only need to do it for that subject. It doesn't have to be across the board. It's subject by subject. So um, moving on now, obviously we've got the current off-call consultation on the autumn series, um, and that closes on Monday, um, at the end of Monday, at a, just before midnight. Um, so if you do want to respond, please do. Now, I would really, really welcome in either the chat section or if you stay afterwards and talk to me about it or, or send me an email afterwards, your views on this, because I have changed um, my view on this. Having initially felt it was quite a good idea, I'm now feeling actually the autumn series is not. So just a reminder of what it is, um, at the start of uh, school lockdowns, the government said that GCSEs and A-levels would be cancelled to replace the teacher assessment, but the students would be able to sit exams at the earliest opportunity. We now know that in the consultation that's been proposed uh, October for A-levels, um, with students getting their results before Christmas, and November for GCSEs, with students getting their results by February. Um, what the consultation from Ofqual suggests is that exam boards would be mandated to put on the full exam series. Of course, they won't know when they do that, how many students will actually enter them. There will be no legal requirement on you as providers, as schools, to put those exams on. So the exam boards will have to put the exam series in, but you could decide as a provider, we're not going to run those. There'll be no requirement for you to run those at all. But if we're focused on the idea this summer of progression, where students are going to, does it actually matter? If a student doesn't get what they really, really wanted, but they can still go on to sick form, to college, to university, does it really matter that they got a seven rather than the nine they wanted? How helpful would it be for that student to, when they're, when they're now you know, fully immersed in their A-level course in year 12, to um, sit GCC history in November? Is that really a useful thing for them to be doing for their education? It might be. Um, if they do, I, I think where this would apply is um, students who miss out on their destination requirements. But I've already said, you know, that caveat that universities and colleges have said they're going to be very, very open. And they, a lot of what we usually see in a much more fixed entry requirements are going to be more flexible. But some students, a handful of students will miss out on those, those destination requirements. Well, if they can't sit their A-levels until October, they've missed that year anyway. They've missed that year of university. They have to take a gap year anyway. So why not give them the full year to, res to revise that properly and sit the exams in the summer? Um, potentially a very small take up, but we won't know and exam boards will be um, uh, putting the whole series on as it stands at the moment. And it could be that actually very few students want to take those up. Remember, it's only students that rented this summer. You can't enter additional students. Who will pay for this? As schools, we know at SAT that you're really um, finding budgets, um, budgets difficult and, and budgets are very, very tight. Can you afford to put uh, a whole group of students in for another series? 
do we pass it on to parents, in which case it raises all sorts of issues around social justice and social mobility. Also, we know that you are really hoping to get some refunds from the exam boards, and the, the exam boards are saying they are looking at how, much, how, how many refunds they can make. If they have to prepare a whole autumn series for every subject, not knowing how many entries they will have, that will wipe out any savings they could pass back to schools. The group that would lose out the most, let's be clear, are private candidates, i.e. students, particularly homeschool students, who were unable to get a grade completely this summer because they didn't have a relationship with the centre who could enter them, or students who were resitting. It is a small number of students, and is it right to put on a whole series for what potentially is a handful of students? Um, and so just a reminder of when those are, and again, at, at the moment under the proposal, the best result would count. So it's not that if they get a lower result in the exams in the autumn, then they would get that result. If they had a higher one in the summer, they would keep that. But again, those results won't count to any performance measures. So it's just about the individual. So my kind of tentative view about this, and I'd really, really welcome your thoughts on this, is that having initially thought it seemed like a good idea in some cases, it might actually be more disruptive. I also have a concern around some of, some of the language here, and this is coming directly from the Secretary of State in that first message he said, where he essentially said, well, look, this is what we're doing this year because exams can't happen, but students will have the opportunity to sit their exams. Um, to me, that, that comes from a whole place of saying exams are better than teacher assessments, which actually, I'm not sure I agree with. I think your teachers, probably know your students better. And in some ways, this summer might be a more valid set of assessments than usual. So with that in mind, actually, do we need to change the narrative we're saying and saying, actually, this is a more valid way of doing it. And exams are not necessarily the best or the pinnacle. Secondly, I've talked about funding, and I think that there's a real uh, funding issue here. Who pays for these exams? And actually, do we do we really want all the exam boards working on a full series, which they've been mandated to do without knowing uh, which students enter? The educational disruption uh, to, uh, to, to young people, again, is it helpful to be sitting exams uh, for a previous qualification now that you've moved on uh, in the autumn? And then again, if we're focused on progression, most students will go on to progress. That's the whole point of the summer. And if they can't, then doing those exams in the autumn won't change that, as opposed to waiting until the summer. So um, any thoughts you have about that, either now or in the chat, I would really, really welcome. Um, Mike, has, has there been any initial reactions? Um, been, there has been one initial reaction to this, yes. um, which is saying, I will read this pretty much as it's been written, um, just so it's clear. So there's issues around year, it's years 11, not getting the grades needed for A level entry. Um, so grade four and five in English or maths. Yeah. Then also, if there is a bigger recent year in year 12, there will be staffing issues. And also there's no guarantee that school will be back to normal in September. Well, well quite, yeah, no, I agree with that. In terms of the, um, the English and maths, um, what I should say is I think in, absolutely in terms of progression, the English and maths resits would would go ahead in November as usual. So I'm not so English and maths GCSE resits would would go will go ahead, um, and of course that's a funding requirement for post sixteen. Um, in any case, if, if students haven't got um, a grade four in in both English and maths, so yeah, com completely agree with that. But yeah, any more thoughts you have on that? As I said, um, we will be responding, but I want to respond uh, and, and best reflect the network. But as I said, my my view of that has has changed over time. So any thoughts you have will be really, really gratefully received. Um, so finally, um, just looking, thinking about performance tables in 2021, which again um, is the next stage that we, we, we need to look at um, as an organization uh, on behalf of the network. As you know, no performance tables in 2020. At the moment, the off-ball guidance says they will be published in 2021. Um, we are clear they shouldn't be. And I think that the, um, the year 10s, the current year 10s and 12s are going to be the most effective year in terms of education, assuming they do exams normally next summer, 
um, I think it would be very unfair uh, for performance tables uh, and performance measures to be published. Um, we almost know for certain the inequality gap is going to widen and therefore it will um, disadvantage schools with a larger disadvantaged cohort. Um, so we will be campaigning for them not to be published. Um, just a reminder, if they are, then any results this summer, or indeed if the autumn series goes ahead, won't count. So I think there are three key areas um, that might be of interest. So assuming that they do, do go ahead, and we hope they won't, the big concern is the GCC English double weighting. Um, a lot of you have been in touch to say the model that you operate is to do um, English language or literature in year 10 so that you don't have um, a huge number of, of English exams in year 11. Um, the DfE and Ofcourt haven't said if um, you would still count the double weighting. The feeling, I think, is not. So essentially, if that was your curriculum model, you would take a double hit in 2021 because A, one of your, your buckets wouldn't count but also you wouldn't get a double weighting uh, in attainment eight and progress eight for English. Another big one is the maths A level. Again, lots and lots of schools saying that you do, um, uh, for students who are going on to do further maths, that you do maths A level in, in year 12 and then further maths in year 13. And of course, um, those students typically do very well in A level maths and it would very much affect your, um, your progress measures and attainment measures uh, post-16. Um, interestingly, that's one that seems to have more traction from the government looking at it and saying, actually, um, that there's more possibility to, 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 to allow math at A-level specifically in year 12. Um, and there have, there have been questions, if you are this summer giving um, centre assessed grades and then therefore leading to calculated grades in certain elements, um, exam elements of uh, vocational courses and BTECs, that have that aren't being awarded until next summer then those qualifications will almost certainly still count in the performance levels in 2021 so even though part of that will have been through calculated grades um if the qualification was not due to be awarded until 2021 um they will still count um at that point i will pause and see if anyone has any further questions or comments um mike can I bring you in? Yep, there have been a few comments and questions coming in. So um, just on the autumn series, actually, yep. who will be responsible for putting on the autumn exam series? Is it the centre that the student's currently at or the one where they were? Well, this is what I'm saying. There's, um, there's no requirement for anyone to do it. I mean, it, it, literally, if, if the whole system said, you know what, we don't think autumn series is a good idea, there is no mandate for you to do it. So um, it's up to you. Let's say that you have a, um, well, so I'm, I'm taking from that question, it's probably a school that doesn't have a sixth form and therefore thinking about students leaving them after year 11 and saying, would they come back to do it um, or would they do it at their current sixth form centre? Essentially, it's up to you as a school that there, there is nothing in the consultation that would make you do it. So if you decide, actually, it's not in students' interest, it's not in our interest to put the exam series on, um, we can't, we, we won't do it. Um, and then it would be up to students to either find a centre that were willing to take them on and let them sit as a private candidate uh, or not. But that's the whole point. There's no requirement on schools or colleges to put those on. Entirely up to you. Okay. Um, then jumping back to central assessed grades and the SARs. Yeah. If we treat a question about CAGs or as a DSAR, do we need to inform the students now that we're doing so? Um, no, no. Well, uh, hang, uh, sorry, I, I um, mis misunderstood the question. Um, yes, you would do, because the point is that you need to respond to one within 28 days. And as Chris explained, and Mike, perhaps at the end of this, we can um, post Chris's um, uh uh, blog into the chat so people can refer back to it. It is um, there actually already. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, but um, if you look at what Chris said, um, if students are asking you now for that information, then um, you can delay it 
but you need to tell them you're delaying it. So yes, you should respond now, but tell them you're delaying it. Or indeed, as I said, ask them, is this a, is this a request? Um, but you, you can't just ignore it legally, as, as Chris said. Um, even like a, a, a one sentence email, Miss, can you tell me what I've got? Counts as a DSAR. So yes, you need to respond. Okay, a um, couple of questions, observations about exams next year. Um, so any indication yet on the likelihood of modifications to the exam specifications for the summer 2021? Yes, um, we, we've got some indication. Um, again, it's just an indication. The general feeling is there won't be modification, uh, apart from in a few instances, uh, for example, the requirement to do a field trip for geography GCSE uh, and some practical elements of some of the science and um, technical subjects. But in terms of the content of the GCSEs and A-levels um, and vocational subjects, uh, what, what Ofqual have tentatively said is, and, and the exam boards have said is, they can't just remove part of the content from the, from the syllabus um, because, of course, they encourage schools to teach the, the, the content in the best way they see fit. So it, they, they can't just take out the last fifth of their published material uh, from the exams because, of course, some schools might have started with that. Uh, what they have said is, of course, the standardisation that they use already adjusts for that. Um, and so, um, uh, essentially, if everyone in the country, if every student in the country does less well because they've not been taught in the same way, they've missed up that part of their schooling, obviously all the grade boundaries would drop. What, of course, this will mean is uh, we already know that more advantage, uh, that, that, that the richer students are getting more online tuition, um, and there's been various studies that have shown that. So again, what that will do is just increase the disadvantage gap next year. But but that's the tentative view coming out from examples. Okay, so staying with exams for next year, um, asking what you think of this idea about for the current year 10s who are moving into year 11, is there anything in the GCSEs next year being, being put back a month? So being taken in June or July, rather than May or June? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a wider question. One of the questions that we're asking the DfE um, regularly is, what is 2021? Um, you know, what, what does 2020, 2021 look like? Do we open schools over the summer? Uh, you know, so, so yes, I, I think, um, lots of questions about what the school year looks like um and of course it, it might be very very it might change a lot depending on um what happens and it, and it might be different to different parts of the country but yeah I absolutely I think it, it's a good idea to to be flexible with that um or indeed if we <laughs> if we find out this summer that actually um there was very little adjustment needed across the system in terms of grades. We say actually maybe teacher assessment is a better way going forward and it, and it raises the whole question about uh, assessment. Yeah. Okay, and the final question that we've had is, um, if units for BTEX were due to be sat this summer, should the exam boards be accepting and taking these grades? Uh, yes, and, and, and they are, yeah. Um, so if, if there's a specific question about that, if, if people could email me afterwards, but um, they are doing, yeah. yeah. And that's everything up to date. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike, as well. So um, if you do have any more questions, please do continue to, to post. Um, but um, what I will say is, um, as many of you know, at SAT, um, we have had um, staff on, on furlough. Obviously, we've been affected um, by the current situation, not being able to work with schools in the way that we usually do. Uh, and we've been doing that on a rotary system. So some of you will have known that your relationship managers or, or members of the education team have been on furlough at different times. It's now uh, my turn to be on furlough. We're all doing it as a rotary system. Uh, so, it's, um, so it's fair. So um, from next Wednesday, um, I will be furloughed. Uh, so these, um, these policy updates will, will stop them, but obviously it's quite a natural time anyway um as this this process is coming to an end as i said we will pick up issues around school reopening <clears throat> and the scientific advice that comes out um separately um but really just to say um you know over um the last two months i've really enjoyed uh working very closely with the network uh and um uh kind of 
getting an understanding of the, of the issues that you're dealing with. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, I, I will be back in August uh, for results days when I'm sure a lot of these issues will come back uh, to the fore. Uh, but as I said before, you know, I think um, th this time is really, really difficult for teachers. Um, over the next uh, week and a half, you'll be making really tough decisions about whether or not you open your schools. And we know that the media and politicians um, have been very unkind about that, as I said um, two weeks ago. Um, but we know that you're doing an amazing job. So thank you on behalf of all of us at SSAT. Um, we love you. We think you're doing uh, fantastic work and you continue to do so um, on the front line. So thank you. If you do have any questions uh, between now and August, then please do email your relationship manager um, on rmteam at ssatuk.co.uk. Uh, my colleague, Angelina, will be uh, managing the email forum, so you'll still get updates from SSAT. You just won't have these <coughs> uh, weekly Zoom updates. So um, thank you to all of you. Um, thank you to Angelina, and thank you to Mike for being there each week too ask me your questions. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.